Hi, everyone. Welcome back to uh, the Big Curator Forum. Uh, this is session two, and this is our final session of the day. Um, I'm Emily Summers, she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm part of this year's forum committee, and I have the pleasure to be moderating the session today. Uh, in addition, Elizabeth Ann Johnson is the Code of Conduct Monitor. Uh, Brandon Locke will be on tech support duties for presenters, and Lara Friedman Shedlov will be handling the Q&A. So this session is a will be a 40 minute roundtable discussion after which we look forward to having a very engaging Q&A discussion for the last 15 minutes. Um, and a few logistics before we get started. So all attendees are muted by default, but feel free to use the chat and Q&A functions. You can enable or disable the chat yourself at the bottom of your screen. And on the chat button, if you hit the little up arrow, you can enable or disable show chat previews according to your preferences. If you have any questions for the uh, speakers, you please use the Q&A feature and drop your questions in there as and when you, they come to you. You can choose to ask a question anonymously if you prefer. That's all for the housekeeping notes I have. So without further ado, let's get started and I'll hand it over to the speakers. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Emily. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to have you all here today. Um, let me introduce the panel first. Um, my name is Hui Young Kim, digital archivist at the Briscoe Center for American History at the University of Texas at Austin. And I also have Brenna Edwards, manager for digital archives at the Harry Ramson Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I also have Hannah Wong, digital preservation specialist at US National Archives and Record Administration. And lastly, David Tannenholz, digital archivist at the RAND Corporation. Oh, I forgot to turn on my video. All right. Okay, so uh, we're here to share our reflection for uh, digital archiving in the Big Creator era. But before we dive in, I would like to tell you a bit, a bit of background on how this session came to be. Next slide, please. So um, it all started with uh, my obs observations from attending uh, various conferences and reading the results of SAA Sensor Survey and NDSA Staffing Survey over the years. Through these um, conferences and surveys, I noticed uh, changing themes within our profession. So initially, I was struggled to find the right word to describe what I was witnessing. This all changed last year, thanks to my great colleague, Brenna, who introduced me to Taylor Swift's um, Eras Tour. And the term era perfectly encapsulated the shifts I was seeing. With this keyword, um, I identified three kind of specific sub eras within the broader bid creator, bid creator era we all live in. The tool era where we focused on developing and learning digital archiving tools, the workflow era where we applied and integrated these tools into our daily workflows. And finally, the advocacy era where we are highlighting the importance and relevance of our work. Today, I'm excited to share um, this concept with you and, and explore the panel's reflection and discussion on the two important questions we have. How have things changed? And also, where do we go from here? Our panelists today have a unique connection to BitCreator, um, having been at UN University, University, <laughs> University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, School of Information and Library Science, when it was the, at the epicenter of the Big Creator project a decade ago. Each panelist has chosen an era that feels um, most connected to and has prepared a guiding question. As we travel through these different eras, I'm, I'm gonna encourage you to join us by sharing your thoughts in the chat section or submitting your question in advance in the Q&A section. Now, I'm gonna hand it over to Brenna to share the first question. So next slide, please. Hi, everyone. Okay, um, so hi, I'm Brenna, and we're gonna start off by talking about the tools era. Um, and this is the question, and I'm gonna sort of introduce, and then we're gonna sort of go around and all talk about it. So as we know, BitCurator is made up of a lot of open source tools, which may be people's introduction to open source so software 
Um, how have you learned these tools? Are there ones you prefer over others within the BitCurator environment or just outside of it? And what do you teach others and why? Um, I will say that for me, I use BitCurator as an introduction to just like a Linux environment and general command line uh, tool introduction, as well as I, whenever I work with students and interns, it's very get in there and explore what tools, but these are the ones I use in my workflow, which is mainly Guy Measure, uh, Brunhilde, Bulk Reviewer. Yeah, mainly those. And I know that there's so much more, but so that's why I'm always like, please keep, go on, encourage, <laughs> um, please explore this more. I'm probably not using it to its full capabilities, but um, I'm gonna let the other panelists share their experiences and what their thoughts are. Okay, uh, let's go with David first. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so for me, it was uh, the initial entry point was with the VM and getting familiar with the Ubuntu desktop environment. That was sort of core learning for me. Um, around that same time that I was getting involved at SILS, I took the Linux, uh, or I'm sorry, the digital forensics course at SILS that Cam Woods taught. So that was um, heavy, it involved heavy use of the big curator environment. I think the final project involved uh, using the environment on a FRED workstation and using all sorts of tools, even like the Windows registry, Red Ripper tool and so on. Um, uh, I might have that tool wrong, but uh, it's uh, past that, uh, it got me much more into the Ubuntu desktop learning. That was, um, like I said, it was very important for me. So I think I, around that time, I also took a little bit of a Linux primer exam. It was the Linux Professional Institute exam called Linux Essentials um, helped me to get my bearings a lot. Um, I think it'd be overkill for anybody who needs to get into the environment to go to that length and or even and especially to do an exam above and beyond that one. But anyway, you choose to learn Linux is helpful so that you can be in the environment and make use of the command line and so on. Um, uh, as I've kind of um, uh, let's see, Work, working through the tools a little bit. I really prefer um, the Brunhilde and uh, reporting tools within the environment and uh, things like bulk extractor and SD hash um, have become very ad hoc um, uh, important ones for me. Um, I use Brunhilde outside of the environment now on a more routine basis, just that it helps to support my um, IT requirements. But uh, but so now nowadays I hop in and hop out of the Bicurator VM that I use, um, depending on sort of an ad hoc, what I need to do at the moment. Um, so David, I think I also had a kind of similar um, experience with Bicurator where it definitely was a kind of opening a door to learning more um, about Bicurator environment. But for me, what it kind of led me to was kind of exploring things outside of the Big Creator because um, Big Creator does really good job of kind of getting the data out of the uh, media or preparing it. But what I needed oftentimes was kind of big things coming to, uh, well, trying to prepare things before going into the Big Creator. And as well as uh, once things like things came out of the Big Creator, how do I um, kind of shape them into a certain kind of packages. So that kind of necessitated me kind of learning more about the Python. And that's kind of how I think the um, first sessions presenter, one of the presenter was mentioning uh, Python is a glue that kind of links these different tools together. And yeah, and Big Creator was the kind of motivation for me to kind of learn more about the Python and to kind of start writing these scripts and kind of combining different tools together. Um, Hannah, I'm curious about your experience. Yeah, so um, when Brenna and Hui Young invited me to participate in this panel, I told them I would have to out myself as somebody who did not take a class uh, where I learned BitCurator at UNC, even though I was at UNC. and should have taken advantage of, of that particular aspect, um, but I, I didn't have time in my schedule. So 
I did, I, I'm mostly, I guess, kind of self-taught in terms of the curator, but um, I am very interested in how people learn and also teach with Fit Curator particularly. Um, and from 2020 to 2022, I worked on a project called Bit Curator EDU, um, in, uh, which was an affiliated project for the Bit Curator Consortium. And um, we put out a survey to different types of education providers um, who teach with Bit Curator or other digital curation tools. Um, and, you know, one of the things we asked about was like, you know, if you don't teach with Big Curator, why not? Or what are the, what are your problems teaching with the tool? And, um, you know, I think according to the survey data and the interviews, um, some of the most successful strategies for teaching with Big Curator were either, you know, somebody who, if the person teaching it was, you know, pretty comfortable doing a live demo, that was great, even better if like an issue came up and you could do live troubleshooting, but that's also very high pressure. Um, a lot of instructors just encourage their students to do kind of self-taught or like kind of self-paced exploration. Um, so this is kind of a sideways way of answering the question just in terms of, you know, what you teach up there and why, but I think that, you know, one of the biggest difficulties with teaching the Bit Curator environment, which I think, you know, has come up at, at this conference and at this conference in, in past years too, is just um, that initial hurdle of at the very least being able to install the VM. Um, you know, there are a lot of difficulties with IT restrictions, students own kind of technical comfort, but also just what they're able to do on the machines that they have. Um, so I, I think that in, in that case, there is you know, there, there is a lot of teaching of some of the tools in the Bit Creator environment, like Bulk Extractor, like Brunhilde, but maybe not necessarily in the context of the environment. Okay. Um, let me go back to you, Brenna, because um, I know, Brenna, you, in uh, last semester, um, you were teaching um, Bit Creator to students. And I'm, I'm kind of curious uh, in the spirit of, you know, learning uh, tool, tools era, um, how did that experience go? It varied. Um, so I had them come in to my lab to use BitCurator versus trying to install it on their own computers because um, I had, during grad school in class, uh, I had a friend's computer get completely wiped out trying to install it somehow. Uh, so I was like, I'm not going to do that to any student just in case. Um, so they came into my lab. So it was a very short period of like, you get an hour and a half to come test out these tools and this workflow, but also like, please explore this on your own. And I mentioned a lot of the tools that are in Bit Curator and was trying to be like, just like throughout the semester, like, hey, this is in Bit Curator. This is a thing. You can also use it outside of Bit Curator, but like, just as just this is what I use. So this is what I am most comfortable with, like telling you about with like authority. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Thank you. Right. Um, I think we cover enough grounds here. So uh, let's move on to the next era. So the second era is workflow era. Um, this is this is the era that uh, resonated with me the most. So um, I wrote a question, what has your experience been like applying the big career environment to workflows at your institution where you have to adopt, where you have to, were you, were you able to adopt it successfully or did you need to make any adaptation? How have the workflows evolved over time? So the reason why I picked this question was, um, after graduating from SILS, um, institution that I worked, they had um, either um, using different platform, i.e. Archimatica, or um, they um, did not have anything. So um, I had this, I had all, I had this knowledge from utilizing the big creator, but then I had to kind of shape that, reshape them into, uh, reshaped them into a peg that fits a certain hole, basically. So, um, and this kind of helped me see 
um, like certain certain aspect that Bikuri was very good at. And even with the like a different environment or a new environment, I was kind of trying to mimic the kind of general process to it. So um and yeah, that has that has been my experience. Um I want to go to Hannah and ask this question. Yeah, so I'm, at my current institution, I'm no longer in a processing role, um, and I don't I don't believe that we use BitCreator in in any workflows. But um, when I my first job out of grad school was at the Wisconsin Historical Society, and um, I think I had initially planned to um, use BitCreator on kind of like a dual boot system on um, on a machine at the historical society. Um, and I think it was, it was helpful to think about what the system requirements were for that and what I would really need to run the environment and like what kind of machine I would need with, you know, what compute power. And I think, you know, I, I was able to advocate to get a machine that did just, you know, have much better compute um, which made a huge difference, but I didn't actually end up installing the curator as like in a dual boot system um, because I think in the time that it actually took to go through the procurement process, I you know got a better sense of what the actual needs of the materials that we were receiving was, and that was you know it was a state archives state government records context, and a lot of the transfers that we were receiving were not necessarily on fragile or original storage media. It was, um, you know, a lot of just direct transfers over FTP or things that had just been transferred to flash drives just for the purposes of transferring. Um, so, you know, in some cases using the Bitcoin environment was kind of overkill in, in a lot of ways. So, um, but what I did end up doing is, you know, I had Big Curator and definitely used it for certain types of transfers that we got, but also, um, you know, installed several of the tools outside of the environment that could be installed outside of the environment, uh, like Bulk Extractor, I think, especially. Um, I installed that on multiple computers so that multiple people working in my area could use it, which was really helpful because identifying PII was something that we all had to do. Um, so I think that it was, um, you know, I, I integrated a lot of the tools in the Big Curator environment at many different points in the workflow, but not necessarily within the environment. Gotcha. And your answer had a really good point where um, you are seeing these uh, type of materials that you were receiving is changing and and that also kind of necessitated a different setup. So that's very interesting. Um, I want to go to David, because I know that you have a like Fred workstation and you're using BigCreator, I believe. Yeah, so um, that's right. So I I can go back to the sort of 2017 through 2020 timeframe for my work. Um, and I, at the outset there in 2017, I really was using the big curator vm in virtual box on the fred um and that was like one of my main processing workflows was to use that with a lot of removable media especially floppy disks and then it, it met all my needs back then um now that hardware is outdated so as a result the vm that i'm supporting is also outdated the big curator iso i think that i'm using is from 2020 um and uh, so uh that was all prior to the start of the pandemic. And then with the pandemic, I had to switch to working from home. I did not have a connection to the Fred for some months. Um, and so I relied on just similar to Hannah, I relied on installing like uh, the uh, Brunhilde package um, and made use of that just remotely just on, on my Mac laptop um, installed by homebrew and, uh, and going from there. Um, now in now I'm kind of seeing a little bit of a need to have a resurgence of my use of Big Curator and I'm kind of dreaming dreaming of something new where I'm sort of thinking about um, uh, the tools more than the environment and sort of wishing that I had like a portable USB of the tools only or something like that or the environment only uh, sort of 
uh, dream scenario for me. But um, but yeah, it was it. Uh, I never used the environment as an image and capturing uh, tool, other than a few web archiving attempts using wget, um, and that was sort of um, yeah. That's sort of where I'm at with it now. It's I'm in flux with my use of it at this point. Oh, that's very interesting. Where like the uses usage kind of go up and down. Um, let's go to Brenna. Um, I heard uh you had a lot of challenges setting the big uh BigQuery environment up. I believe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I will say at my first job, I it was already in use uh, at Emory. And so I didn't have to adopt it. I did get to explore um, adding in Brunhilde and Bulk Reviewer because those were deployed at the time that I was at Emory um, and are now in the newest uh, ISO distro for BitCurator. Um, but at UT, I had to set it up. It may have been used in the past, but then the computer disappeared while the archivist changed and the pandemic happened, uh, just, you know, um, <laughs> normal things. Um, so I've installed it uh, as a dual boot and had a lot of fun conversations with IT about like, hey, I'm going to do this, is that okay? And they went, sure, just don't expect us to help with it if you break it. And I went, that sounds okay to me. Um, and and at one point I went to update it and managed to erase Windows 10 on the desktop hard drive from the university. Um, they really loved me for that one. Uh, I went, you said you wouldn't fix the Linux one that you would fix mine, like the one that you guys own. And they went, okay. And they took my computer for a month. Um, <laughs> And then just recently, I actually managed to uh, kill the second hard drive. I don't know what I did. Um, but it suddenly stopped working. The computer wouldn't recognize the second hard drive. So I had to reinstall. And it worked out pretty well, which was great. Um, but it reminded me, like, oh, setting up this up as a second, like, self, like, its own hard drive that's not a virtual machine is like you have to be comfortable with running like command line and being like knowing like following the ubuntu install steps to get that put in and then installing the bit curator distro on top of it and just if something goes wrong you have to know where to look and uh, be able to google the errors if something goes weird with your ubuntu install um so yeah it's been very interesting uh I used the virtual machine for a bit in between while I was waiting for the new hard drive to come in and I filled up the memory at the computer really quick. So there was also that issue. Um, so I've, I've tested many different ways in many different versions of it. <laughs> um, but it all works. And like once it's installed, it's pretty fine. But um, yeah, just being willing to test the new tools that come out and uh, like I said in my previous answer, like need to do ex explore more with what already exists in the environment and poke around with it and see what I can maybe make better in my workflows with those tools. Yeah, it sounds like the um, it's 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 um, I think you had a really good point where you have to struggle or I guess have a struggle with the IT department in order to get it running. Um, and I think that transitioned really well into our next era. Next slide, please. Advocacy era. Yeah. Um, um, I think this was um, Hannah's era. So I will ask Hannah to lead a, lead a question or pose the question. Yeah, so I know this was something when we were coming up with the panel that, you know, is something that's emerged from different surveys around people who work in digital preservation and digital archives, how much our jobs end up being advocacy, internal and external advocacy. Um, and I like, as I mentioned, I don't work in a processing role anymore. Um, but I feel like the curator gave me a really helpful 
framework and foundation to talk about digital preservation, to talk about different concepts, and also the importance of adopting open source tools and contributing to open source communities like the BitCurator Consortium. Um, so my question is, has BitCurator influenced how you talk to colleagues about digital preservation? And how do you advocate for the adoption of BitCurator and other open source tools at your institution? Mm. Um, I'm going to go with Brenna first. Yeah. Um, so I tend to just be like, hey, I am installing this and test it out and then have proof that it works to be like, hey, we're doing this now. Uh, IT hasn't yelled at me yet for it. <laughs> uh, one day they will. But um, it's also on a non-network computer, except like whenever I need to upload things or I need to download the university updates that they do so they don't quarantine the computer. Um, but I also, again, it, whenever I teach, either like in a formal classroom setting or like just one-on-one -on -one with students that come in and, or interns that come in, it really helps to be like, this is BitCurator. This is what it can do. And this is how it can be used for digital preservation. Um, and it's like I've mentioned, like it's a really great introduction and then they can get their hands on it and they can play with it and experiment with it and be like, well, what does this do? What does this mean? Uh, how do I learn Linux? And it gives them the tools and terminology to then take with them as they leave onto their first jobs in the world and be like, hey, I understand this. I've had bits of experience with this. Like, I know what I'm talking about. I've done this. I've imaged a floppy disk. I've imaged a CD. Like, I know what to do. I know what steps I need to take as like a basis. And so it's really like, advocating for them to advocate for themselves and learn that way for me and just being like no I did it you, you can do it too I believe in you and sort of using it as a tool like helping them start to build their toolkit to advocate for themselves gotcha um I'm gonna like kind of expand the I guess the stakeholder a little bit so in my current situation I'm not using big creator but I do use the kind of the foundational concepts like the the broad the workflow that kind of big creator environment has um defined uh, i am i am incorporating those into my advocacy to my coworkers um because um digital archiving i'm not the, i'm not the only person who's doing um the work from beginning to end. So I have to work with the sessioning archivists as well as the processing archivists, as well as um, people in the development because um, they need to talk to the donor as well. So, um, but it's, I have to say it's hard because um, there are certain concepts that just, uh, it's just very difficult to explain in a plain language. So, uh, the advocacy becomes kind of it recently it has become kind of like majority of my job kind of writing different kind of guidelines explaining the steps or writing the memos to explain it to uh different stakeholders so yeah the kind of and doing this advocacy work more and more i i see um that I can't really do it alone as well. So um, I think this, this era is making me uh, to kind of reach out to the different digital archivists and kind of form a local group. So um, local group and kind of talk about uh, sim similar issues because um, I'm also noticing in other institutions, uh, regardless of size, is having a difficulty in advocating for uh, digital archiving programs. So um, when, so like inside of group, uh, we're kind of chipping in for um, do a more um, bigger thing or a thing that can, if a thing that can um, help to help entirety of the group, things like that. So that has been my advocacy experience. I'm gonna now go to David. <laughs> 
Um, well, I mean, I'm the only person that within the archives team where uh, where I work that uses BitCurator. So while other members of my team know about BitCurator, they're not they don't have the hands on uh, time with it. But in speaking to any potential donors, we often will have messaging to them that says, you know, if you're concerned over any transfer of content tests that has sensitive data in it, or if you're needing um, needing any sort of uh, workflow applied, we have specialized tools, we'll say. Um, so we have a sort of not jargonated language that describes what we what we um, can do and what our capabilities are. So one of those is using BigCurator uh, and the tools within. Um, and um, past that, I haven't just had much of a need for uh, needing to uh, serve as an advocate for use of the environment. Like I said, I'm the only one using it. Um, but uh, but the maintenance of everything surrounding it is something that I'm finding I need to advocate for. But since I'm on kind of a cycle with hardware and and so on, that I need to I need to find the right opportunity to say we need a refresh and you know we need we need to think about the next thing that we need to purchase that can run the environment on it and can do better and, and so on. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, and I'm also thinking like kind of zooming out a little bit where um, if we zoom out from big career environment to the big career community, I think there is um, power in this power in this community as well, where um, I think, you know, with only handful of uh, digital archiving conferences, as well as groups, um, you know, this is the place where um, many folks in this uh, profession comes together and kind of have a discussion about uh, broad topics on digital archiving. So um, yeah, BitCurator, I think as a community, um, there is a value to it as well. So, and I will wrap this era with that comment and move on to the next era. <laughs> All right, so after advocacy, what is it, I guess, future? So uh, next slide, please. So we're gonna talk about the future because um, I think a lot of people have this on their mind right now. And um, I will let David share the question. True. So uh, with a big shift in the landscape of IT towards adopting AI and machine learning tools, how should we make use of these new tech offerings and apply them in our context? And here's a bit of a baiting question for the whole group. Does generative AI have a place in our work? So uh, uh, Huyang, um, I'm, I might be able just to offer my own perspective, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, go for it. Okay. So we are not sure yet how generative AI would fit in within the whole digital forensics or digital acquisitions workflow that we do or that an archivist would do. Um, institutionally, we are always focused on, on trends and so on. So we, we are paying attention to everything coming around with generative AI and we are thinking through what to do and what not to do. Uh, there's gonna be a, a need for attention to be paid to the guardrails and to, and to protecting uh, to protecting people and to thinking responsibly. So we're, uh, for me and my team, we're very, uh, or the team that I'm on, we're very comfortable not being at the leading edge or the bleeding edge of the generative AI trend. We wanna listen. We wanna take info from all sides, from especially from thought leaders in the context of archives, like the, there, there's a group called From the Page. It's, uh, uh, have released a bunch of interesting seminars over this past year and any others that are formulating their thoughts on this and, and how to proceed. Um, and personally, I'm you know working just on skilling up right now to know how to work in that space effectively. Um, I'm seeing so many interesting ways that people are using GPT and so on and LLMs. Um, so just taking guidance um, and, and yeah, it's uh, notable for, for this panel that um, uh, looking at the big curator uh, grant projects that have come around over the last decade that the two of the more recent ones are AI projects. They have AI baked in. They are the Big Curator NLP project, as well as then the Raytom email uh, preservation project. Those are two 
ones for the DigiPres community that actually are adopting an AI uh, sort of uh, system. Yeah, um, I can kind of build off on your answer, David, where um, I guess I'm on a more pragmatic side because, um, you know, being being the digital archivist at the center and it's like a one man department situation. So um, I am happy to utilize um, technology that can, uh, I guess, you know, do MPLP basically. So um, my exploration, recent exploration has been kind of more on the like value added side. It's, I, I have not kind of try to use AI in a like a core archiving task. So value added mean meaning um for example um using um you know optical recognition. I mean OCR technology has been out there for a long time, but um I've needed to read the tables or forms in a structural way. So on that in that instance, um, you know, the Amazon Text Direct worked really well. And um, I guess with the recent generative AIs, um, uh, looking into generating uh, captions, basically, um, out of the video files and audio files. And, you know, those are all kind of like labor intensive tasks. So I've kind of looked into um, using AIs into those areas. But um, I'm also kind of very interested in, um, you know, the newer generative AI, AI stuff kind of helping alleviate some some of the pressure from the core tasks, such as description, because um, when I'm given with a 10 terabyte of content, you know, I just have to wonder, you know. So um, I've been kind of following, uh, we are the UT, UT Austin is a Microsoft campus. So, uh, and we have a kind of dedicated Azure instance where we can use OpenAI GPT more securely. So I've been kind of playing with um, different automation where I could, to see if I can throw files into the GPT and see if it can generate a meaningful description. So that has been the, my expression so far, but, I'm sure I people will tell me like, are you thinking about A or Z? So um, I will hand it over to Hannah to tell me that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. Um, you know, just kind of your your explorations to hear about that. Um, so at the National Archives, so there was an executive order a, a few years ago, I think actually, for federal agencies to. Um, do an inventory of their AI use cases. So NARA actually has an inventory of our use cases, which I'll drop in the chat. Um, but you know, I think what's listed there is it's not a lot of generative AI. It's a lot of NLP, a lot of machine learning. Um, you know, we're looking at using um, AI to screen for PII to assist with the declassification and redaction process. Um, and also, you know, to, to use it for some descriptions. Um, and at the same time, we're also working on an AI governance policy for the whole agency. Um, and I think, you know, before we, you know, I, I think, you know, it is not necessarily a bad thing to use AI and use generative AI in the field. But I think as we start to do that more, you know, it's important to kind of take a step back, particularly for things like description and kind of think about what the job of an archivist is and, you know, where can AI supplement rather than replace, you know, what kinds of things need to be done by a human. Um, and I think that there's, you know, definitely a need for like advocacy and some organizing around that and delineating, you know, what, like not just for job protection, but partly for job protection, you know, what things do need to be done by a human. And, you know, it's it, it's kind of like, you know, thinking about the writer's strike in Hollywood, like, you know, humans need to do some things and they can be assisted by AI, but really kind of thinking about that carefully and not doing like cart before the horse, I think is important. Yeah, Hannah, that's a really good point where, um, 
you know, AI could replace us. <laughs> Sad truth. Um, and I can I can already see uh, my processing archivist say, well, they can't read the paper. So, um, but Brenna, I know your position on AI, so I will ask yeah. you to close us out. <laughs> Yes, I am here as the person who is not a fan of AI and work. While I think it would be great to do descriptions, <laughs> uh, especially, um, I think that it like just it exploded so much recently, and people are using it to um, like create fake images and do all of these like nefarious things like there's always going to be bad actors but also before like as we as a profession both archives and libraries go all like yeah we should do this like we should think about the ramifications and if it matches like our professional ethics and standards and morals um and um there's also a lot of like uh, the UT has like a whole year of AI thing where they're trying to encourage everybody to use AI and the libraries have a group on it to like how can we use it and we're sort of tangentially involved in that but I'm over here going I can't even put files online because of copyright issues so how are we supposed to like throw things into these AI models um, for them to then, you know, take all that information and spit something back out at us without it using it to train the model. Um, and that's something where people start going, uh, well, we can, and I'm like, we, if, if we do that, then I get to put everything up online. And so you have to like, think about this. Um, so I think we need to like, what we need to see if it's going to die off like nfts have sort of died off um or see if we can get like official policies created for these things uh and so that people sort of have more structured ideas of what it can do what it can do in this specific context and making sure like there are policies and plans in place for well what what happens to it then <laughs> yeah yeah more on the cautious side but I can yeah. see how it's useful. No, no, I think that's um, a valid reason um, to be cautious about, um, you know, like just straight out adopting um, AI into the work or like current workflow. Because um, I work with metadata archivists closely and we also kind of been exploring um, into uh, writing some portions of finding aids. Uh, namely the bi bi bibliographical information portion of it. And then, because um, that usually is the kind of very difficult to write neutrally. So um, we've kind of had a, several test cases on um, telling, telling basically generative AI to uh, write someone's bio with the like information that we supplied as well as some of the um, web page that we found, and we were finding that AI was AI was like hallucinating on a lot of facts, and um, and it was very difficult because um, you know like we cannot fact check every single detail of in our donor's life, so sometimes it will fly um, um, under underneath. So um, yeah, I don't think it's a technology that it can be just straight out adopted into our workflow right now. And definitely we do need to kind of, we, I, I do think we need to scrutinize more um, where is this data going, especially as well as, um, um, as well as the point that Hannah was making, um, are we basically replacing ourselves right now? So um, I think, uh, I will stop here because um, I know we can probably go on forever with this topic. So um, I'll pause here and I would like to kind of open up the conversation to the audience. Um, um, 
you are more than welcome to answer any of the questions that I just showed you. Um, I'm sure there's certain eras that you resonate with, but I also want to ask uh, some different questions because um, I am really want to hear from those of you who learn Big Creator by yourself or through professional development opportunities. Because um, this panel learned it through the um, education programs. So I want to hear your experience and what has your Big Creators been like? And um, another kind of question I want to ask is um, current high school students. Um, does your curriculum include Big Creator environment? And um, if so, um, you know, what are you running right now, learning right now? And um, just want to hear like what aspects of today's discussion um, kind of stand out to you. So, um, but first, because um, the Q&A section is going to be not recorded, I'm going to go to the next slide and close out first, and then we'll go to the Q&A section. So, for those of you who are watching this as a recording in the future, um, thank you for joining us. Um, if you'd like to share your experience or have a question, um, feel free to reach out to us via email, and uh, we can't wait to hear from you. So bye, and let's go to the Q&A.